both. Thank you for your nice presentation, Anna. It was, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon to everybody. Good morning from those that are on this side of the day. And uh, thank you for your presentation. It's a challenging situation. I am presenting here something that is much, much slower than what I've been hearing up to now. So uh, what we, uh, I will be presenting you is the application of the wonderful presentation that uh, the previous speaker gave us. And uh, it was an interesting talk by Julia who did present the basic uh, points of everything that is fast. Well, we are here in a world that is a slightly slower, but not so slow. Uh, and uh, but I don't want to dwell in uh, too much of uh, introduction. So the mighty power of photosynthesis is because exactly like any uh, any well-being is based on uh, the use of uh, energy resources. Earth is also based on uh, the use of energy resources. The energy is sun. The uh, the car is the planet. Uh, and of course, engine are plants, the photosynthetic uh, organisms. And um, photosynthesis has shaped life and the structure of our planet. Since the beginning of the formation of the planet Earth, uh, we know that uh, some microorganisms able to uh, take advantage of solar uh, radiation appeared. And uh, initially Earth was not populated uh, much and was definitely not an oxygenic uh, planet. But then evolution brought in oxygenic species, the so-called oxygenic photosynthetic bacteria that started poisoning the atmosphere, shifting from a reducing atmosphere to an oxygenic one. And actually, if you can see this curve here, at a certain point, at a certain point, the um, evolution on Earth of this species, the appearing of new and new photosynthetic species, brought us to the Cambrian explosion, where the oxygen level reached roughly 30% of, of uh, the overall composition of atmosphere. And at that time, the amount of oxygen and the amount, the dimension of um, animal on Earth were it is, was so, so big that you can see Scolopendra, which is a small bugs that are now populating Earth uh, and are mostly, at the most, five centimeters were longer than two meters. And dragonfly, you can hold them in a hand and not completely cover them. Well, you know how small dragonfly are today. So, yes, photosynthesis is also responsible is responsible of shaping the earth is also responsible of how uh, we how to say how we survive consuming energy because roughly three to four hundred million years ago a large number of uh, uh, trees and uh, plants and also animals landed on the floor of uh, oceans and then in time were covered by sand and silt and at the end due to pressure high temperature we got um, oil and uh, natural gases these two things uh, are directly bound to photosynthesis and of course um, we, we all know that and we all know that there is a need absolutely a need for substituting fossil fuels and photosynthesis is also involved in this idea of substituting for, um, fossil fuels. So uh, just by quoting Devin Gast, uh, I would say that photosynthesis is arguably the most important biological process on Earth. Uh, it's so because the amount of energy that is played in this uh, uh, process, it's humongous. So the theoretical potential of solar power is given by the uh, integral of the flux over the surface of the earth and if you just make this nice calculation you end up with roughly 90 terawatts now this represents the amount uh, in, in, in an hour this represents roughly the amount of energy that it was used 
in the entire year of 2001 from all sorts of combined energy. So we have here uh, a powerful energy source and possibly a system to um, convert it in other forms of energy useful for us. What we need is to understand the mechanism and how to do it. But this will be this part of the second, uh, the second part of the talk. What I want to do now, is just introducing you to photosynthesis and to its applications, um, by starting with presenting the few more, the some molecular aspects of photosynthesis, and uh, these are. Uh, based mostly based on the use of pigments. Pigments are the most important uh, players in photosynthesis. More, very important are these pigments based on these two tetrapyrroles, uh, the chlorine and the bacteriochlorine. Um, the difference by uh, simply one double bond in one of the, the pyrrole rings. And uh, these two molecules are the heart of the photosynthetic photochemical machinery that converts solar light into free energy. And this heart is specially uh, formed by the chlorophylls, which are an extension of the chlorines that we saw in the previous um, transparency, and uh, has uh, some other substituents on the uh, um, external part of the ring, and a fetal group here on the bottom, where um, bound to the D cycle of the D porphyry, the, the um, uh, sorry. And uh, so, um, so the fetal uh, chain is absolutely uh, important because it helps the system to introduce itself inside the proteins. And you will see this in a moment. I just wanted to show you that there is a second um, a second uh, uh, here in cycle B, uh, there is a double bond which can be uh, present or not present. And again, this is the difference between chlorophyll and bacterial chlorophyll. Uh, while I'm insisting so much on this molecule, well, because if you look at the absorption of this molecule, um, you can see that it spans from uh, the entire spectrum, uh, our visible spectrum, starting from the low wavelengths uh, run for 100 nanometers to the high wavelengths. And it spans from roughly 680 nanometers, which is the red reddish color, uh, and ends up to 800, 812. Now, this is very, very important because the most important part of photosynthesis is the light it goes from 600 to uh, 900 nanometers. And they will see We'll see this a little later. Uh, on the top of this uh, absorption spectra are, is the um, absorption, the, the um, uh, flux of photons coming from, from the sun and eventually being absorbed on Earth by uh, photosynthetic organisms. And you can see that most of the absorption of the chlorophylls fall in the red near IR um, part of the spectrum. There are many different chlorophylls. Um, but together with chlorophylls, we have carotenoids. Now, carotenoids fill a hole, which, if we can go back to this transparency, is the hole between 500 and 600 nanometers. And carotenoids are fully colored uh, uh, molecules that are also inserted within the proteins, as we will see uh, in a few minutes. And uh, differently from the uh, chlorophylls, these molecules do not play a, um, a central role in the conversion, but do play a role in harvesting light. So we just saw a few uh, pigments, but these pigments that we saw were uh, presented as uh, single pigments in solution, uh, typically organic solution. What happens when they are inserted in biological systems? Well, the difference, differences are striking. Most of the system uh, have their uh, maximum absorption uh, shifted toward the red. And indeed, you can actually reach in some specific microorganism absorption of the bacterial chlorophyll within the protein that reach 100,000, 1100 nanometers. This offers you coverage of, full, uh, of the full spectrum 
from 400 to 1200 nanometers. It's so important because it covers all the visible and infrared light that are the most, uh, the largest amount of the photons that reaches Earth. Uh, well, this is just another view of, of say, of, of viewing things and just keeping it. So very quickly, who does photosynthesis on Earth? Well, there are, of course, higher and lower plants. We all know the green plants that uh, are surrounding us. But then there are the algae and the bacteria. I will mostly concentrate myself on the bacteria because it's the simplest. And in 30 hours, we cannot have a, a complete course on photosynthesis. So bacteria are divided into two classes. The one uh, identified by a blue dot and those by a red dot. The difference, the main difference is that the blue dot are typically uh, oxygenic species. So um, photosynthetic organisms that do photosynthesis oxygenic, so they are appeared later on the planet. And the red dots identify species that do unoxygenic photosynthesis. So the photosynthesis that, that appeared on Earth more than 3.7 billion years ago. Uh, they are all neg gram negative uh, bacteria, uh, although there is one gram positive but none of them is pathogen. Um, so if you look at the diversity of the photosynthetic organism, it's very striking that there is only a single mechanism that is um, uh, able to convert the solar light into other forms of energy. Uh, and that is the photochemical uh, mechanism. But of course, this may come as a surprise, but it's not, since they all share the same evolutionary path, and the evolutionary path is the best way of converting solar energy into energy viable for us and for other uh, inhabitants of planet Earth. So I'm just will focus on one single uh, guy. This will be our uh, host, uh, actually our guest. The photosynthetic bacterium Rhodobactus ferroides. It's an important bacterium because it's been a model for many, many years, model of photosynthesis for many, many years. And I just wanted to show how it's organized. We have thought, you know, in biology, it's important to see how things work and how things uh, are made up. So you can see here uh, an external um, membrane, uh, an outer membrane that divides the um, growing milieu from the uh, internal of the cell within immediately below there is this internal membrane in this internal membrane there are this invagination of the membrane these are not untouched they are attached to the upper part of the cell so they seems to be floating in the cell but they are not and these are called um, intracytoplasmic membrane within this intracytoplasmic membrane there are located, they are located the most, actually com the incomplete photosynthetic apparatus of the uh, uh, photosynthetic bacterium. Uh, and if you take the bacterium and you squeeze it in under high pressure and then release it at uh, atmospheric pressure, the bacterium explodes and those uh, intracytoplasmic membrane break up and then seal again, forming the circular vesicles that are called chromatophores. And the sealed vesicles are formed by four types of protein, five types of protein at the most. So the antenna proteins here shown in green, the, um, um, and the, the second kind of antenna showed as red rings around the, the central bacterial reaction center, which is this molecule here protein here in um, bluet. The BC1, so the counterpart for the establishment of the delta pH across the membrane. And finally, the ATPase. Now, the ATPase is an important protein that uses the energy uh, converted by the reaction center to synthesize ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is the, um, the exchange money for energy in biological system. If you have ATP, then you can do almost any reaction you can think in a biological system. Now, if you open up the, uh, the, the, um, the vesicle and, and make it flat, you can see 
uh, representation, a simpler representation with uh, the, the reaction center sitting here. The um, LAC1, which is here represented as a red and is shown here as a circle surrounding the reaction center. And then these small molecules that are called LAC2, where LC, LH says for light harvesting. So this part harvests light and the reaction center instead converts it in uh, from sun, from photons to charge separated state. We will see this in very, in very soon. Now, this is the central the protein portion. Um, these two are two different enzymes which are responsible of the convert the absorption of the uh, photons and its conversion in a charge separated state. On the left hand side, you, you're seeing one that is uh, the first one that was crystallized. Uh, it's from a bacteria called Blastochloris viridis. On the left, uh, on the right hand side, um, you see the uh, one from Rhodobacter spheroides, our guest, I'd say. And the way it works, light is absorbed by light coming from directly from the sun or from excitation transfer from the uh, antennas arrive to this uh, protein. The system works by circulating uh, electrons within its uh, uh, internal part, and then protons get transferred from the inner part, so from the periplasm out in the, in the cytoplasm, and uh, can, will be used then to synthesize uh, ATP. Um, I added the, a, a transparency because I saw that uh, Yulia was using uh, so many uh, Nobel Prizes in her talk, and we also have our, our and that's a crystallization of the first photosynthetic protein. Uh, it was awarded to um, Dyson Offer, Huber, and Artmut Michel in 1988 for crystallizing the first protein on the left, the one, the most complicated one uh, here, the one on the left. Um, so we know we have an, our Nobel Prize. We have very interesting thing because it was showing, uh, they showed for the first time that you can actually crystallize, um, crystallize um, uh, membrane protein, integral membrane protein. And uh, that's why they won the Nobel Prize. But their work was extremely nice because we have now a precise description of what is the reaction center. The reaction center had, um, took his terrible name uh, because the person who first isolated and individuated as a, um, a central enzyme for the conversion was a guy called Roderick Clayton who wanted to leave a mark on the... Um, on history, and actually he did because it's um, RC is exactly the the words the the letters that form his name and last name, and this molecule here is composed by has a rough um, weight of 100 kilodalton, formed by roughly 1,000 amino acids. Then it has three subunits, which are here colored the three three different colors. Um, nine cofactors that are shown here on the left, on the right, uh, four of which are bacterial chlorophylls. We saw already chlor what are chlorophylls. Uh, two of them are two bacterial pheophytin, and uh, pheophytin are just chlorophylls deprived of the central magnesium. Then two quinones, and quinones are very important as an electron acceptor. We already heard it today and also yesterday in the nice talks. And one iron uh, ion, not him, iron ion, that sits here and mostly plays a role in the structural uh, system. So this is how the, uh, um, the cofactors are organized in the, in the reaction center. This is uh, the three subunits. Uh, um, what happens is that along one of the branches that the electron is shuttled from the dimer here, which are two bacterial chlorophyll overlapping one to each other, to the quinone. And this overlapping here is actually, uh, pardon, this uh, electron transfer here is a hopping between the dimer, the bacterial chlorophyll A, the bacterial pheophytin A, and the quinone A. And finally, to the quinone B. Actually, the system works like a semiconductor. So light is absorbed and promotes electrons from the balance bond to the conduction bond. And then the electrons will reach eventually 
uh, uh, do catalytic side, one E rich and the other E poor, where electrons get transferred uh, and moving all the, the energetic of the system. The energetic of the system is so nice because the engineered system is so well organized that before any charge recombination takes place, a forward electron transfer reaction happens. So, and the forward electron transfer reaction is at least two, three times faster than the uh, back reaction or the fluorescence. So from D star, which is the dimer excited state, chlorof uh, electrons get transferred to the bacterial chlorophyll A in uh, 10 to the minus 12 second, uh, arrives with the bacterial 15 A, and uh, the recombination will be 10 to the minus eight, but in 10 to the minus 10 seconds, it reaches this, the other uh, electron receptor, and then again, faster than the recombination reaches reaches the last electron receptor. So what you actually have done, you have moved by roughly almost four nanometers the uh, electrons from the position of, of the dimer to the final position of the quinone. And this allows you to move around the protein to move around the um, move around the electron from one side to the other side of the membrane. This is amazingly done by this system and is a uh, sort of a, uh, a paradise for anyone who want, wishes to do photochemistry and elect, study electron transfer. The optical spectrum of the protein is very important for us and you have several peaks, some of them are associated to the dimer, 865 nanometers, then to bacterial uh, chlorophylls or bacterial pheophytin, then you have the second Q bands of bacterial chlorophyll and bacterial pheophytin, then the B bands of the bacterial chlorophyll and bacterial pheophytin, and plus the final uh, absorption band that includes quinones and uh, uh, aromatic amino acids. You can use it and have the uh, difference between the uh, dark and the uh, uh, light spectrum. And you can see that this peak, which is 865, is comp and 860 five nanometers is completely bleached when it's illuminated. That's because all the electrons get promoted to the um, first excited state. And you can actually use this band here to check the kinetic of the reaction. These are very, the one I'm talking here is a very slow electron transfer reaction that go from milliseconds to um, to uh, seconds, actually, uh, but they are very, very important because they allow ancillary chemistry to take place after the photochemical acts that generates charge separated state. So we're talking about a chemical uh, um, time domain that, that is uh, order of magnitude slower than what Yulia was showing, uh, but also order of magnitude more efficient in transferring than the charge separated state to uh, chemical reactions. And here is one of the examples that I wanted to give you. You can see here are two different, uh, um, two different uh, charge recombination experiment. You can see here the red line here as uh, an experimental that uh, uh, was obtained by uh, shooting a flash of light here to the system. There is at 865 nanometers, then the system is fully bleached and you can follow the charge recombination of the system after the light has been removed. In this red um, trace here uh, is actually uh, the photosynthetic reaction center to which the QB side was removed. So you only had electrons reaching here. So the charge recombination is faster because it has to go from here to here. If you then take either another reaction center with the QB or reconstitute the QB functionality, the electron has to travel all the way from the D plus to the QB minus. And amazingly enough, there is no electron direct charge recombination for QB to D plus, but it repopulates the QA site and then recombines from here. So that's you actually see a very slow decay that has a, an average time between one and 1 1.2 seconds. And of course, in one to 1 1.2 uh, seconds, you can, also, you can do much, much uh, nicer thing than in, uh, in chemistry than in uh, 
picoseconds. Uh, and that is the purpose uh, uh, of the following um, presentation. But before going to the following presentation, just to want to indicate, and this is probably my last but one transparency, uh, the effect of the chemical environment. If you look at this graph here, the black line is represented by uh, is exactly what we saw in the previous one. So is this one represented here? And then you can actually solubilize this protein in different uh, kind of systems. So uh, detergent, uh, uh, liposomes, or liposomes made of negatively charged, uh, um, negatively charged lipids. And you can see that you can slow down the uh, reaction, the recombination reaction, up to ending up to a recombination reaction that takes about three four seconds. This is a humongous amount of uh, uh, time for uh, such a system to um, uh, be used for chemical reaction. Of course, there is a trade-off. The slower the system, the lower the energy stored in that system, but uh, you can play with trade-offs. There is always a way to play if you have a trade-off. Uh, let me just show you, I hope I'm in time, but let me show, just show my very last, uh, my very last uh, um, transparency, uh, my very last slide, sorry. It's half Italian and half English, I don't know why. But that's the application of photosynthesis in the living world of today. We can have it in biosensors, uh, generation uh, um, from bio, biofuels of third and fourth generation, production of biohydrogen, bioelectricity, biosensor, cellular in the cellular farm, and uh, biocatalysis, it's important in growing fields and artificial photosynthesis. You already heard uh, Julia uh, showing some ideas on artificial photosynthesis. We will apply this in the next talk. And uh, you can do this kind of things either using the whole organism or portion of the organisms, and to do this, you have to be a visionary. But as young Sheldon Cooper says, there is a fine line between being wrong and being visionary. And unfortunately, you have to have to be a visionary to see it. I hope I can see it. Otherwise, it's a bad thing for me. So thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, I'm open to questions. And sorry if I was too long. No. Massimo, you were perfectly on time, they say. Uh, so we have now a little time for questions. So I don't see any question in the chat, but you can uh, switch on your uh, microphone and ask Massimo directly if you want. Or just write it, something too, in the chat. Too much biology. Too much biology today. <laughs> Uh, I can break the ice, possibly, so, uh, asking, uh, uh, you know, having had the, the Yulia talk just before your talk, I realized that you have this, uh, in this um, uh, reaction center, you have these two branches, very similar to what Yulia has in uh, her uh, beautiful molecule. So I'm wondering first, uh, there is a reason for having two branches and not uh, a single branch, why nature chooses this complex architecture. And then uh, could one possibly think about an experiment like uh, Yulia did, uh, putting some vibrational energy or some energy uh, disturbing one of the two branches? Okay, the answer for, to the first question is why nature uh, made up this thing in this way, it's, Probably it was a trial and error way in evolving. And at the end, they found out to have a B plan. So in a photosynthetic organism, something can always go bad and one of the two branches may not work. So you have a backup one that can work. So it's evolutionary and uh, uh, struggling for life. So the redundancy. Other, yes. yes, redundancy. It's, it's very important biological system. There is an all history of theoretical biology on redundancy. The other one is that, uh, of course, you can do this. Uh, and there is a fantastic group. There are several groups to do this. The most advanced one is the group by Van Grundel in, uh, at VIA University. What it does is exactly what Julia presented, TRIR, in, uh, in 
in reaction center. And in biology, we have the lack of having the possible of making a mutation within a protein. So it was not only able to change the chlorophylls and bacterial chlorophylls within the protein, but also to maintain this molecule and change small amino acids that would move energy around. Mm -hmm. And he has a, a so many understanding of this system uh, that it will take like three days only to present his work. Uh, Rinky, Rinky Van Grundel is an institution in the Bacterial Reaction Center and fast photophysics and photochemistry. I see there is, a, there, there is an hand raised by um, Ali. Ali, can you? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, uh, so thanks for your talk. I had a, a, a more general, broad curiosity about what's understood. Because, uh, you know, you showed these very nice pictures of the photosynthetic system. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, this is a very static picture of, of you know, the system. And I imagine that there's a lot of conformational heterogeneity dynamics. Uh, what's, you know, what's the extent, what role does conformational fluctuations play uh, in, in the various processes of photosynthesis? And is this, is this under, completely understood? What are the open questions there? Well, um, thank you. This is a very nice question. Saying that something is completely understood is uh, uh, overstating. Okay. But uh, uh, in terms of uh, what goes on, what goes on uh, in the very first uh, femtosecond, the fluctuation uh, it's all within the dimer, so the two bacterial chlorophyll uh, facing each other. And what mm -hmm. happens is that that if you saw that system, it looks almost. Uh, uh, symmetric, very symmetric, but that's not exactly true. There is a break in the symmetry, particularly around the um, the dimer, and the breaking symmetry is exactly in the composition of amino acid that sits with to one uh, chlorophyll on the other one chlorophyll, and that's how uh, nature chooses to use the A branches because the energy of the B branches is unfavored compared to the energy of the B branches because the excited states has the electron sitting most of the time on the A branch, A uh, bacterial chlorophyll of the dimer. So mm -hmm. actually that's absolutely true. And uh, this was shown by contemporary experiment, uh, by experiment done with the uh, EPR, mm -hmm. ENDOR and uh, fast, uh, fast photophysics and photochemical experiments. I see. And the other thing is that you also have a very nice uh, description of the uh, the um, conformational changes because you can do what is called the time-resolved X-ray crystallography mm -hmm. by uh, the advent of um, free electron lasers as a breakthrough from for biology. You throw so much energy that the molecule breaks up, but this happens within a few almost tenth of picoseconds. But then you can take X-ray images in uh, the time between zero and 10 picoseconds and reconstitute the movement of all amino acids before the system explodes. And actually okay. that's, uh, that's something that they're doing very nicely at the, in, um, in Arizona, in Temple University. And there is this group that is building uh, uh, fell electron laser x-ray facility and uh, if it wasn't for pandemic i would be there since last year because i got mm -hmm. a position there but i never was never allowed to reach them because of covid-19 so covid-19 is a horrible thing also for this thank you thank you very much for sure. fascinating fascinating Thanks. thank you other questions so from the audience, so please write on the chat or raise your hand. I will try to follow. Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, oh, that was an excellent talk, uh, uh, Professor Trota. And uh, Thank my you. question in the direction that, you know, uh, in the uh, synthetic or semi synthetic approach to mimic photosynthesis, mm -hmm. what are the challenges that exist? I mean, you know, what constituents 
of chromophoric systems are required in order to nearly reach there or like have some similarity to what uh, photosynthetic reaction center would be? Uh, well, most of the things were explained uh, extremely uh, carefully and detailed by Yulia. Yulia showed you that uh, if you take the simple system, then just uh, the model system, the first model system that appeared, the um, the trade-off for having a simple system is that the charger combination has a time that is so fast that you cannot do anything. So if I may say, what is the um, drawback at the moment to artificial photosynthesis is complexity. The system we are using, although very complex, they are too simple compared to the natural systems. I only showed you a general image of co the complexity of this biological system, but you have to imagine that between each um, step of the electron transfer, there are at least 10 to 15 amino acids involved. So, and that's why the lambda, the reorganization energy that comes in place is so relevant in uh, um, determining the, the rate transfer charge combination or forward electron transfer. So, uh, I, I, in one word, is the lack of complexity, the, the real drawback at the moment for artificial photosynthesis. Thank you. Once again, I very much enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Very happy. I just want to comment on this complexity thing. It's very, very interesting. So basically, we have to start to study systems where there are several chromophores, because you need this cascading. And most probably also, as also Julia pointed out, you need also vibrational coupling or conformational coupling, call it as you want, uh, some relaxation of your system as to avoid uh, going back. Very, very interesting uh, consideration, I, I, I would say in general. Uh, there are more questions, comments? If not, I think we can go straight to the second part of the presentation. And let's see what Massimo has in store for us. Yeah, just let me comment on what Fatima wrote. She said that uh, uh, just the, the thank slide, strange that even it contains many languages, but it does contain wow. Arabic words. Uh, Fatima, please send me the Arabic word. I will insert it. I apologize for being so uh, um, I'm polite to you. So if you if you do send it the Arabic word, I will immediately insert it. So please do so. Uh, okay, yeah, let's go to the second part. Um, okay, I'm sharing the other one. And just to anticipate to Fatima, we'll have the same problem in the thank you transparency, also in the second part. Okay, coming up. You should see it now, don't you? Yes, yes, it's, a, it's fine. Oh, thank you, Fatima. She sent me the, the word. Uh, OK. Um, again, applications. Uh, I was asked to give a, a general part, general topic, and then application of the uh, in my research. Uh, of course, we have to go back to the center for the chemical apparatus, which is built, as we were saying, by a protein scaffolding, which the, uh, um, the um, pigments are inserted. I showed here only the uh, head of the pigments. Uh, I, I 
cut away the uh, um, hydrophobic chains because they will confuse the scheme. But each of those um, pigment has, or quinone, has a long chain, at least uh, 15 to 50 uh, carbon atoms, because these molecules have to be very stably bound to the reaction center, but not covalently bound. Now, given that, uh, I will just go forward and uh, mention this thing of complexity. Uh, so solar-driven chemistry is the game to play here. Well, as I was saying, uh, one of the very first example of uh, um, artificial photosynthetic molecules is this triad. Uh, and you can see you have a carotenoid on the end, a central porphyrin, and a quinone. This is a very bright way of thinking. You can just make up uh, a light absorbing part that distributes excitation to the carotenoid, which gives an electron to the quinone. And of course, if you wait long enough, the electron of the quinone will recombine with a, a charge left on the carotenoids and uh, the system will go back to the, um, to the ground state. Well, the point is that the lifetime of the system, although very high in yield in generating uh, charge separated states, is 60 seconds, uh, 60, pardon, nanoseconds, uh, which is, as I was saying, too short for any ancillary chemistry. Uh, and so um, people understood that there was needed for something else. So they added in a second porphyrin and a second quinone. And you can see that the pentad elongates the pathway between the electron donor and the electron receptor. And so effectively the charge combination got much, much longer. Uh, the yield was comparable. Um, but still, 200 microseconds is too short. So to make this, I was uh, asked this question before. So what is the difference between uh, um, this natural, the natural system and this system here is complexity. And you need complexity exactly as you need complexity in uh, uh, a, a soccer game. You know, artificial photosynthesis, the system just being played by the two goalkeeper. We kick the ball, hoping to make goal on the other, um, uh, to the adversary, to the opponent. Uh, while when, and that would be very boring as a game. But then uh, if you had the other players, uh, the complexity of the game increases and we like it more and more. At least I like it more and more. That's exactly the difference between artificial photosynthesis and natural photosynthesis at the moment. So artificial photosynthesis adding is adding players, but naturally uh, biological photosynthesis has already the players in the, their place and they're playing very nicely. Um, we were saying that uh, it's so well designed that the forward electron transfer is always faster than the charge recombination reaction. And you can actually have a conversion of 100%. So each absorbed photon from the reaction centers is converted in a charge separated state. And that is what we are looking in also natural system. That does not happen. Contemporarily, you have um, high, um, high efficiency conversion and a very slow uh, recombination rate. So these two are typical of photosynthetic natural system, biological system. And um, as I mentioned, is because of evolution between each electron transfer step, we have so many amino acids that play, um, that, that, that have an interplay in the energy distance between the, the pigments, and they may have also an interplay. For example, here, these are 15 angstrom, there is no way that the electron would rally from here to here just by that simply. There are at least four histidine, four histidine uh, uh, amino acids here that lend their own orbitals to allow the movement of the electrons from one quinone to another. 
So complexity is the goal and is what we do and, and, and is what we need. So what we decided to do uh, is to take advantage of the chemical complexity that comes directly from nature and eventually assemble it with some inorganic patterns to, to generate the so-called hybrid organic biological assembly. And if you look at the energy conversion efficiency, you, you, we already mentioned that grows going from artificial to natural system because the structural complexity grows from artificial to natural system. Of course, chemical robustness instead decreases if you increase complexity, but that's a trade-off, the famous trade-off we were talking about. So for example, PS2, which is this uh, photochemical core that sits in the plants uh, is uh, so efficient in converting that at a certain point is too efficient <clears throat> and it can't react with oxygen, destroying the proteins itself. So in nature, this protein is has uh, its own uh, healing mechanism, which one part of the protein destroyed by oxygen is um, discarded and a, a new piece of protein is uptaken, synthesized, uptaken and inserted in this enzymatic system to allow to repeat the photosynthetic, um, to repeat the photosynthetic uh, process. And this takes about half an hour. If you just take and extract this protein after half an hour, it just breaks apart, it will not work anymore. Um, so there are best practice for RC exploitation, this hybrid system. And uh, I will just show you a few examples because I have not so much time. And of course, if you extract the protein and you want to be sure that whatever you do is useful, you have a fully vectorial, you need a fully vectorial arrangement. That's because upon the generation of the charge separated state, every protein is possible to be represented as a dipole. And if you do a reconstitution, for example, in on an electrode uh, to take advantage of the charge separated state of the dipole, then uh, you want to have uh, configuration of the dipole, which is this one, all oriented in the same direction, so that uh, they all work cooperatively toward one direction. Instead, in the lower case, you have a 50-50 distribution and each dipole uh, will kill the effect of the dipole of the previous one by eliciting the whatever effect we are doing. So. Um, this was the idea that brought us to do what we will show you. And together with uh, uh, the fact that you can actually isolate the reaction center, reconstitute in um, liposome, whatever, of vesicle of phospholipids. And eventually, if you look at this photocycle here, you can allow adding external electron donors and electron acceptors here. Queen, so, so external uh, reductant and internal uh, quinone. What you can do, you can shy light and obtain the first charge separated state. Now, the system is organized in such a way that if you have an external uh, um, electron donors, before the, the combination takes place, actually before any forward reaction from the QA minus to the Q minus takes place, the uh, dimer, the uh, radical cation, can be re reduced and you end up with a radical anion in the molecule that moves and can be a doubly, uh, you can do, you can repeat the experiment with another flash, obtain again uh, the radical D anion, QA minus, QB minus, and the radical cations. The cations get again reduced by the external donors. So you end up with a molecule, a quinone. If you remember the position, uh, this is the uh, uh, on the B <clears throat> on the B branch. This is a, a doubly reduced quinone that uptakes protons from the uh, external water, generates a quinole that leaves the protein and is substituted from external quinone. So this you can then repeat the photocycle. And if you look at the actual result of the photocycle is that protons are uptaken from one part 
and confined and moved to the other part of the photocycles. So if you actually have a family of uh, um, oriented uh, reaction centers like we see here, um, and you can do this in a closed vesicle, ideally you could have uh, a change in the pH in the internal side of the closed vesicle and an increase of the pH, uh, pardon, uh, lowering the, of the pH within the, 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 the cytoplasmic milieu or of this um, um, closet vesicle and an increase in the external. Well, actually, that's exactly what we decided that was very, very interesting to do. And what we did is reconstitute the reaction center within those giant vesicles. Now, giant vesicles are liposomes that can be obtained quite easily, uh, but their size is gigantic. Exactly, they can go from one to 100 microns. So if you imagine one bacteria would measure roughly one microns, you can get large amounts of, of bacteria or whatever within the central milieu of these giant liposomes. So what we did is to bind a uh, 404 to the reaction center, reconstitute the, uh, the vesicle with the reaction center. And you can see the fluorophores is mostly is almost exclusively bound to the uh, um, B layer of the giant vesicle. Then you can upload, you can fill the uh, giant vesicle with the pH indicator, exactly pyranine in this case, and you can see the fluorescence of the pyranine. And if you combine the two images, you have a giant vesicle surrounded by reaction centers and with the internal side um, showing the um, uh, presenting the fluorescence of the pyranine, the pH sensitive dye. This is the actual uh, view of the giant vesicle in uh, um, microscope, and this is a fluorescence microscope. And you can see there is a lot of uh, variety in the dimension, but we set up to choose the dimension of roughly 20 microns. So this is a fast representation of the um, giant vesicle in which roughly 90% of the reaction center is reconstituted with the, the dimer, which is this flat part here, exposed to the external and the quinone exposed to the internal. There are some that are opposite, but they are cancel out. And if you just look at the photochemistry that I showed you, you can have the electron traveling from the quinone, from the dimer to the final quinone. You can re reduce pardon, the reaction set, the dimer using cytochrome, and again, cycle the cytochrome from three to plus, from three plus to two plus using ferrocyan, uh, ferrocyanide. So you have a full cycle that can be um, driven by illumination, and electrons will be picked up by the um, from the uh, internal solution from the inside of the vesicle you can actually show that this is actually taking place by um, measuring the charge recombination of the this charge charge separated state here and you can see that in presence of in in absence of uh, cytochrome you have a full recombination rate while the recombination rate dies out if you had cytochrome that's because this is re reduced and there is no way that electron can go back to d plus because we have no more d plus so we showed the orientation we saw we showed that the uh, uh the, the orientation is corrected for us and then in time we illuminated in 15 minutes we illuminated the uh different vesicles these are three different giant vesicles and you can see that the ph inside changes because the uh Pyranine become more and more brilliant, uh, and the fluorescence of the pyranine, pyranine, I'm sorry, uh, increases uh, uh, because the pH, internal pH, uh, increases. Uh, and you can do this also by showing uh, um, the change of the pH in time by plotting the intensity of the fluorescence calibrated toward the internal vesicle pH. And you can see there is a linear behavior between the amount of light that actually reaches the giant vesicles and the delta pH. So 
This is important because we were able to obtain a fully uh, oriented system that can be used to read photochemistry in a closed vesicle. We can imagine this is a very powerful system. Um, the other thing that we uh, showed that uh, was that uh, the other important thing is that we want to increase cross section. As I mentioned, the reaction center is surrounded by light harvesting complexes. These light harvesting complexes are proteins that are generally very, uh, that tend to de degrade under a harsh condition, while the reaction center is much more stable. So we like to take them away during isolation and end up only with the reaction center. But that kills, cuts the uh, the uh, um, cross section of the system. So less light is absorbed and the system is less efficient in a long, uh, in long uh, accumulation. So what we did is uh, as a proof of principle, we just took this nice uh, molecule that was taken from the lab uh, for organic chemistry. Uh, it is not built to be a very, very efficient uh, fluorophore. It has three, uh, a, a two triple bond that are conjugated to hexyl, um, to, to benzenes. And uh, there is a central core here that is very fluorescent. Uh, this central core here, you can play around to have also bound some uh, um, hexyl group that will allow to stay within the membrane since we are thinking to bind it to the reaction center. And here is the system that we use to uh, conjugate to the license of the reaction center by biconjugation to the uh, via uh, succinimidyl ester. What we do is just we take the uh, spectra of the um, reaction center in black here, the spectra of the uh, uh, AM molecule, the one that we saw before, and this is the fluorescence of the uh, AE molecule. So, if you look at the peak of the absorption and generally this band of the uh, uh, IA, uh, then you see that there is no absorbed correspondence absorption of the reaction center. And so you actually extended the uh, ability to absorb light, uh, but would this be efficient in generating charge separated state? Well, we thought yes, because the emission peak corresponds to one of the absorption peak of the reaction center. So when we do bioconjugation, we actually see that shining light where only the fluorescent molecule absorbs, then you have an increase of five times in the um, charge separation state uh, production compared to the native reaction center, so the one that lacks the artificial antenna. And similarly, we can drive the photocycle that I showed in the first in the first uh, transparency, in the first slide. Uh, and you can see that there is a three to four times increase in the rate of the photocycle because the an artificial antenna is driving faster and faster the electron, the energy transfer from um, the 2D reaction set. Uh, well, the, you can also have some structural informations uh, and uh, we try to have the uh, crystal structure, but since the system is quite disordered, we could only see uh, one binding point to the leasing uh, M1110, uh, sorry, which is close enough to the, but anyway, this shows that the, the binding molecule it close, is closed enough to the um, pigments to ensure the foster electron tra energy transfer from the fluorophore to the pigments, explaining why we have such a good converge, uh, such a good increase in the charge separated state. We also, then we, we decided to, to team up with this organic chemistry group. And you can see here all the molecules that they did for us. And uh, many of them they're used and improved uh, in different way, the charge, the, the um, yield of the charge separation state. So we actually are also able to, uh, uh, we were also able to increase the, um, yield of conversion in different parts of the spectra. The other application I wanted to show you is that uh, um, this is probably uh, the most 
well, very interesting for me. I don't want to say the most interesting. As I was saying earlier in the first part of the talk, we have these closed vesicles, and uh, this is the entire photosynthetic apparatus. And you see here the ATP synthase. The ATP synthase, as I mentioned, is the molecule that produces ATP, which is the exchange kind, the exchange currency for energy in biological system. If you have a way to producing ATP, you can drive most of the biological reaction. What we try to do was to use again giant vesicles. See here, this large giant vesicle. Uh, isolate the um, chromatophores, which are naturally organized to have all the photosynthetic apparatus uh, already well ordered in its um, B layer, and having the ATP synthase outside the um, protruding toward the outside of the. Uh, uh, of the vesicle. You can see here how it works, light, then combining the uh, entire photosynthetic cycle, and finally the synthesis of ATP in yellow here as molecule that produces energy. Now, if you reconstitute the, uh, uh, if you reconstitute this, the vesicle called a chromatophore within the giant vesicle, then you have a photosynthetic way to produce ATP within a giant vesicle. And if you can have uh, a T7 RNA polymerase, you can, and the template RNA, you can actually synthesize mRNA, just shining light on the system. And you can actually look at the formation of mRNA by looking at the uh, uh, fluorescence of the amino acridina complex, showing that uh, uh, the entire system can be considered as a, a minimal cell for a biosynthesis of mRNA or proteins or whatever you can think of. Well, this is a proof of, of, complex, of co proof of concept. So you can think of something that's not sure we, that we can do, but I have to say so to be cool. Anyway, this is experimental part. Uh, this is the... Um, the way we isolate the chromatophores, they are all uh, picked at uh, the dimension of 100 nanometers. And if you can look here at the macros microscope, you can see the, uh, these are time images. You can see here the curvature of the giant vesicle. Here is the chromatophores. Some are open, some are broken, but mostly are open. So broken, broken closed, closed, sealed, sealed. Now, if you take this yellow part and zoom it out, you can see that in the top part, you have a, a bubble here that you can look more carefully and reconstitute and recognize as the ATP synthase. So we know we have a sealed chromatophores showing the uh, uh, ATP, and you can use this to synthesize ATP. Uh, showing the ATP is, and you can use this to synthesize ATP. Um, so if you do some tricks, uh, you can also, uh, the same trick of uh, the cytochrome I showed before, you can show that roughly 70% of the chromatophores are sealed and functional, so in this fashion here. And if you shine light on the system and you have your amino acridin uh, um, channel open, you can see that uh, shining light for longer and longer time increases the fluorescence of the amino acridin, which binds to the, uh, which is present within the um, sealed vesicle and binds to the mRNA as soon as it's formed. So in time, what you're seeing is that fluorescence increases. And if you do this in a calibrated way, you can measure the amount of RNA that comes directly from the uh, fluorescence of the uh, amino or uh, acridine orange, the amount of ATP that increases and then decreases, increases as is formed by the chromatophore, chromatophores and then decreases because it's consumed during the reaction of the synthesis of the mRNA. And of course, the decrease in the ADP, which is the uh, a substrate for the ATP synthesis. Now, uh, I hope I didn't go too long again, but uh, uh, here it is, my uh, 
terrible transparencies. Again, apologize to everybody whose language is not here. And um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Massimo. Uh, you stayed on time perfectly. We have time for a few questions, if any. Uh, there is one, from, one uh, raised hand from Eric Ottenson. Please uh, open your, uh, switch on your uh, microphone and ask a question. Oh, no, perhaps I was wrong. It was just a... Uh... Yeah, it was just an uh, applaud. Uh... Okay. <laughs> ah, oh, oh Thank okay. You. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> any any other question, comments, or any other applause? <laughs> uh, I don't see questions for now. Um, I have a well, perhaps a not nice question, a nasty question. Um, uh, let's put it this way: uh, I appreciate your idea that. Uh, uh, borrowing from uh, nature uh, allows you to go towards complexity much easier than going in the chemical lab. Uh, the question is, the nasty question is, how expensive it is extracting this structure from nature? And if you compare uh, with the cost of chemical reactions and things like that, uh, how difficult it is, how expensive it is. Uh, thank you for the question. That's not an nasty question. That's in the sense that we ask ourselves, it is worth doing or it is not. At the moment, we are playing with the proof of concepts and it is always worth it. Sure. Uh, the fact that we were we were published by PNS was really worth it. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Okay. But if you actually think to this proof of concept, what we are trying to do is... Uh, uh making this thing simpler and simpler so we want to use this technique of for example of atp synthase in the next step by using the whole bacterium now this is expensive in terms mostly in uh, um, manpower because of uh because all the, the the isolation the control the system that rebuilding is really uh time expensive and you have to be very careful. So you need fantastic students and postdocs. The thing is that um, if you can do this with um, entire bug, that would be perfect, I imagine. The problem is that entire bugs wants to stay alive. And so the first thing that happens when you have a, a, a bacteria within a giant vesicle and that bacteria start to eat the bilayer of that giant vesicle because sees it as food. So mm -hmm. that's what we are trying to, we might have the same results in a system uh, uh, formed by a giant vesicle and, and a bacteria, but we have to try to find a way to avoid bacteria eating up the giant vesicle. That's, and that's, uh, that's a nasty question. So <laughs> yes, when we'll be able to do it, uh, hopefully before uh, retirement. Okay, thank you. Other question, nasty or good or whatever. <laughs> Hi, uh, Massimo, I, I thank you for the talk, uh, I have a question, actually, curiosity. I remember somehow from other sources that the overall efficiency of photosynthesis is not that great, but today I was happy to hear from you that actually in the separation, in the uh, process of separate, uh, creation of, of uh, charge separated state is very efficient. Uh, so it's like 100% almost, mm -hmm. but uh, so where is then the, uh, bottleneck, uh, um, if, if uh, you might say something about this, if, if there is one, or maybe I'm wrong, or remember. I'm wrong. No, no, you remember very well. So it, it, um, efficiency as a way to measure the capability of our system to convert one thing into the other. So the trick to having the highest figure is to take the right conversion uh, reaction. So if you look at the charge separation, that's 100%. If you look at proton transfer, it drop to 60% because there are a lot of other processes that gets into the way. If you look at the uh, uh, synthesis of carbohydrate, then you 
drop below 1%. So you're right, photosynthesis in its absolute, so for example, the conversion uh, to, from, from light to, con to carbohydrate is below 1%. And that's definitely a non-efficient way of, uh, of working. So everything depends on when you start to intercept your electrons to make a good use of them. The entire story is that you have to do it before they get converted. So you should intercept your electrons, once they're producing from the photosynthetic apparatus and before they go in any further metabolism, and for example, draw them out to an electrode. But of course, in doing so, you don't have to kill the, um, the bacteria or the plant or the, of, of the algae, because otherwise it will last uh, a very short time. So what this, I don't know if this makes sense to you, but uh, what we're trying to do the community of biohybrid photosynthesis is uh, to play with the photosynthetic apparatus uh, within the organism in such a way to extract half of the electron from the metabolism and leaving the other half for, for the metabolism. In this way, our idea is to um, eventually be able to convert uh, sunlight in energy with an efficiency of 50% which is of course not as good as the initial one, but still very good in terms of a system that has a very, should be ideally very sustainable for the energy conversion. Hope I did answer your question. Yeah, yes, yes, thank you. I was just thinking that nature, I mean, it's interesting to think that nature did very well on one part, which is the first one, and then uh, was not probably I mean, there must be some reason why the second part is uh, definitely harder to achieve. Uh, but yeah, I guess this discussion. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's uh, uh, there's a huge field in uh, theoretical biology that asks why nature is not so good as in photosynthesis. But uh, we could go but through it. But I'm sure that there is time for more uh, for more stuff to come in in your lecture. So. I will avoid to waste your time. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are other questions? It seems not. That I guess uh, Massimo will be happy to answer any question of course. receive also offline. And sure. uh, so we can thank Massimo again. And uh, we close this session, this part of the session. And we have a small break for 15 minutes. So we will reconvene at 45, no, at 12, sorry, at 12, uh, with the contributed talk. So thank you.